Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. We're looking forward to a very interesting session. My name is Alan Budman. I'm the Vice President of the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs uh, for training. Uh, every week we have a new reason why you should join men's clubs or be active. And today's has to do with the fact that we are a bottom-up organization. By that I mean, if you have an idea for a program or an initiative, bring it to us and there's a very good chance that a program will become a national or international program. That happened with our Yellow Candle program, Build a Bear, uh, Worldwide Wrap, many other programs. So just uh, know that your voice is heard. Uh, if you are happy with our what we're doing, we have placed on chat an area that you can donate. You could give a donation, for, for example, in honor of Barry for the wonderful job I know he's going to do. And I'm <laughs> happy to introduce Barry, so I have a lot of confidence. Barry uh, Kling has created and led family-friendly satyrs for almost 20 years. His satyrs combine music, knowledge, and humor to create memorable, entertaining evenings for participants of all ages. Barry, without further ado, the floor is yours. All right, well, happy, uh, I hope everybody had a good forum, and I'd like to thank the Federation for offering this to share some of my Seder experiences with all of you here today. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, so I just wanna tell you, so this whole thing came about as when, when I got married with my wife and we had kids and we were starting to think about Passover and having a Seder, we thought back to the Seders we had and attended when we were younger. And they were kind of two extremes. There was the say every prayer, say, read the entire Haggadah, stay up till midnight, if you don't really understand Hebrew, you were kind of just sitting there doing much of nothing. And then there was the, ask the four questions, say the say Kiddush, uh, and then someone would ask the fifth question, when do we eat? And then the chicken soup would come on out. Um, it was kind of two, two extremes and we decided that there had to be something better. So we kind of challenged ourselves over the years to create a Seder that was different and uniquely ours. Um, something that would be, as you'll see, real, personable, personal and memorable and fun. Um, over the past 20 years, we have tweaked it um, as our, most of the tweaks are a result of the Seder guests growing older. We started when my son who just turned 21, just turned 22, was a year old. And I also have a 26 year old, a soon to be 26 year old daughter. Um, we've evolved it. As, they, as their ages have evolved. It started when my daughter was like five and we've kept going and going and added more, more things in. We've invited additional families in. We have about four or five families that come every year. And even last year when we had to do Zoom, I'm happy to say that every family still attended. So we basically have had 100% attendance every time we've had our seders. Um, and we've had people knocking at our door trying to get invited to our seder. So it's kind of been fun over the years. Um, so with that said, I talk a little bit about our goals. One of the biggest goals of our Seder, clicking, um, is this, I love to refer to this quote by Rav Cook, which is Hayashan Yit Kadesh Vachadash Yit Kadesh, all about making the old new and then taking that new and making it holy. So what we like to do is we like to, uh, so what the purpose of this, what webinar is, is to give you some ways that you can transform your Seder from whatever experience you have um, into something that might give you a little bit more interactivity, or might be a little bit more fun for people depending on their ages. Um, and it just some new ideas, uh, embrace the new ideas and kind of reinvigorate the tradition of the Seder. I know that my kids look forward every year to our Seder, which when I was growing up, I really dreaded going to the Passover Seder. So it makes me feel great that some of the stuff that we've been able to do has reinvigorated that tradition and that love for Passover in my kids. Um, so what we're gonna kind of talk about is gonna be kind of general concepts um, on the various kind of what I like to say, the big sections of the Seder. So we're not, we're not gonna like get down and dirty into, into the readings of a lot of the prayers or just kind of the bigger picture type things of the Seder. Um, so we're going to start with what I like to say are some general ideas. Um, the first thing I like to say is, um, I'm going to try to do this here. Oh, sorry. Okay. Is we want to have an inclusive, welcoming environment. Um, 
So that means from the moment people come in, they're going to know that our Seder is going to be kind of different. And what I'm going to try to do, if my Zoom lets me, you can kind of see over here, this is a picture of our Seder table from a few years ago. Um, what I like to, what, what, what I love about this is every place is set the same way. Um, everybody gets the same silverware, the same plates. Everybody gets a placemat with their name on it that's been personalized, that's been personalized to them. Here's a kind of a closer up picture of, of a specific playmat. Over the years, um, they kind of designed to look like matzah. Um, these get made. We have a whole collection of them for people who have come. Uh, we have had wine stills on them, so it kind of works out that way. Um, the other thing that's important to us um, is we, um, up front, we do not recite the entire Haggadah. We do have a time limit on our Seder service. I think that helps people get more involved in the Seder, um, and we do stick to our time limit. So we might say, if our Seder starts at six o'clock, we're going to be eating at 7.30, and at 7.30, Wherever we are, we just start eating. Um, we do watch the time and we make sure that um, if we have to eliminate sections, I'm not afraid to do that because the longer it gets drawn out sometimes, the less likely people are to um, remain active participants. And I love to have people actively participate. Um, so I, we do go around the room, we do have readings. Um, and these are readings that um, I don't necessarily go around the table in seated order. I will randomly go around. We randomly kind of go around, uh, kind of keeps all the guests on their toes. They don't know what they're going to read. So they can't kind of like read three seconds count. Oh, there's four people ahead of me and I'm going to be the fourth section. Um, so they're kind of paying attention and looking along with that. Um, I will also do pre-designed uh, pre readings to help of people who might not necessarily be able to read Hebrew or things like that. So what you can kind of see here, this is a reading that we would have a lot of the, um, the, 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 uh, our, the mothers at our table, all the women at our table. This is a special prayer that um, I actually found online. Um, it starts out humorous, it, toward, it starts out humorous. So we always have a lot of laughs. Um, and then we will, then towards the end, it kind of gets a little bit more serious. But what's nice is, everybody's got a role in it. So people who typically may not necessarily get roles at seders. I remember growing when I went to wine to seders, it was very rare for the women to participate in the seders. Some of the seders I was growing up with, they were kind of left to just kind of flounder um, and sit. Um, and I didn't really like that. So we definitely have roles for everybody at our seder. Um, overall, we try to make sure that we want to make it personal. Um, we make it real, we make it fun. And most of all, we want people to remember our Seder so that they will come back the following year. Um, we'll, I think at the end of this session, we'll have some time for questions through the chat and Alan will facilitate that. So we'll just kind of, I'm just gonna kind of meander through this. Uh, think if you have questions, think about them, jot, jot them down. I'll be more than happy to spend time at the end going over whatever you wanna go over. Um, and the pictures and the attachments you're gonna see are things that have actually happened at our seders from uh, over the years. Um, so it's not, they all work, they've all been tried, uh, not just necessarily at my seder, but at other seders as well. Um, there are some original, is, is some original stuff. There's also stuff that's been found on the internet, which I find is my best source for information. Um, so now the most important, one of the most people who are starting to host Seders tend to get bogged down a lot with the Haggadah. And I like to tell people not to worry too much about the Haggadah. Um, as I always kind of say, the Haggadah is there so that we say the right words. Um, it's really like when you're traveling, if you're planning a trip, let's say to Italy, you go out and you buy four or five different guidebooks and they all have the same places you should see. They all describe them differently. Um, so to me, the Hag every Haggadah is basically the same content. What's important is how you actually use that Haggadah and how you actually augment it. Um, so I like to make sure that people don't be afraid to stray away from that Haggadah. It's just kind of there to set the guide for the evening. So when you come to a part of the Seder, maybe you take that road that you may not necessarily go down, you could always end up coming back to the Haggadah. So what you see here, um, on these screens are three things that we typically add in 
every year kind of straying away from the Haggadah. Typically, you know, everybody on Shabbat, you bless the children, but that is conspicuously absent from the Seder. So we always make sure to bless our children at the Seder, um, kind of gets them involved. It's a little different. It adds a little bit to the service. Um, then candle lighting, we always do at the Seder, um, but it's typically usually the, the hostess might get up and light the candles and, and say the bracha over that. Uh, but we like to get everybody involved. So we will always have a reading specifically geared to lighting the candles that all of the women will get up to or anybody who wants to will get up to and participate in. Um, and then over at the end, again, like I said, we have this Miriam's cup, which we kind of stray when we get down to the cup of Elijah, we say now we're gonna have a Miriam's cup ceremony. Um, and what's really nice about this is many of our guests have received Miriam's cups perhaps as bat mitzvah gifts. So they bring them and we have a table full of Miriam's cups that we're all able to participate in, which will get us to some other, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, cups and stuff like that in a couple of slides over. Um, so these are just ways to kind of stray from the Haggadah. Now at our house, we stray, our strays, the, the role, the way, the, the rules of our road are kind of guided by the themes of our evening. So we tend to have themes of, to our Seder. So what you see in front of you are just two of the themes we've done. Um, one of them you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, we did a Harry Potter Seder, and then we did a Disney Seder one year. Um, the themes, um, basically, we then have all those other readings that we've created. You'll see throughout the night, some of the, throughout this presentation, other readings kind of come back to those themes. So we actually had, uh, we'll see later, we actually in our Disney Seder, when we talked about the four sons, we kind of related to four sons to the characters from Winnie the Pooh. Um, so all of the things were still there. We still did the regular four sons in the Haggadah, but we also had um, a Disney ice version of them. So we always will have a, that kind of guides us um, and keeps us focused, uh, it, keeps, it keeps us focused. It also highlights some of the things we're gonna learn throughout the evening. Um, and so when we have our theme, when we introduce our theme, our theme is always introduced with some relevant thing to the theme. Um, it might be a song. So if you kind of see over here, this was the way we introduced our Disney Seder. Um, and if you can imagine um, the opening of the Lion King movie where they hold baby Simba over the mountain and sing that really weird language, I'm not sure what they're saying. This is how we opened up our Seder. We had we had some matzah, we, had, we were all holding matzah in our hand. We all stood up as if we were Rafiki and we went, ma nishtana, kind of like that. Um, so that just, um, it gets everybody involved. And when we had our Harry Potter Seder, of course, we sorted everybody through our sorting kippa to various houses. And throughout the evening, um, houses earned points just like they did in the Harry Potter movie. Um, so everybody was housed in a different house. Um, so other themes that we have tried over the years, just to give you a note, is um, we did a theme, a, a Las Vegas themed Seder, where we also learned a lot about the Jewish history of Las Vegas. And it's amazing how much Jewish history and Jewish connection there is to Las Vegas. Um, we did the same thing one year with a tribute to Saturday Night Live and the Jewish connection to the world of comedy. And we learned an awful lot about the comedians who, some of the older comedians, the Borscht Belt and the comedians and just the whole, the whole Jewish comedy connection. Um, we've also had typical satyrs where we've talked about Broadway. And then one of my favorites was we did a Rocky Horror Passover Seder where it was basically an interactive Seder. So any of you who are familiar with the Rocky Horror Picture Show, when certain things happen, uh, on screen, certain things happen in the movie theaters. So we had the same thing where we had when certain things happened at the Seder, certain things happened in, in the Haggadah, certain things happened in the Seder. So with ever, when, whenever we talked about Pharaoh, everybody at the Seder had to scream out mean and nasty. So throughout the night, we had a lot of mean and nasty going on. Um, so that's just one way we kind of keep everything flowing and a little bit different is we kind of group things by themes um, and every year it's a big, it's a big reveal when the theme comes out um, and how we're gonna do that. Um, when we get to Kiddush, um, Kiddush is always a fun thing. One of the things that I always 
didn't like when I was growing up was I never got a cup of wine or grape juice. I just got, I had like a little plastic Dixie cup. Um, so in our very first year, when my kids were, when my daughter was five and all of our guests were under six, all their kids were under six, every kid got a plastic kiddish cup that looked like a real kiddish cup. Um, and we used them for a few years. And as they grew older and older, they would bring their own kiddish cups. So we made sure that everybody had a kiddish cup. So at the very end of one of our last seders, everybody had a kiddish cup, whether it was from like their bar mitzvah or from their wedding or a family heirloom that had been passed down. So there's a family, there's a personal connection to them when they're making kiddish. Um, the other thing we have done, uh, we, all, we try to do is um, for each of the four cups, we do try to have a different type of wine. Um, I'm sure you all know there's a lot more than just Manischewitz now. There are thousands of types of kosher for Passover wine. So I always tell folks, take advantage of that. Um, learn about uh, the region of the wine. You can have an entire ge geography lesson um, at your city when you study wine. When you study wine. Um, if you kind of see over here, when my Zoom button picked up, this was our wine for our Disney Seder. We had four different cups of wine. Um, and as you can see, each wine bottle was topped by a Disney princess. Um, and the reason they were each topped by a Disney princess is because one of the other things that we do from an educational to, to provide a little extra knowledge beyond Passover is we typically dedicate each cup of wine to um, something relevant to our theme. Um, one year, it had been an exceptionally harsh winter in the Boston area. Um, and so we did a winter wonderland Seder and we dedicated all the cups of wine to the local meteorologists for helping get us through the weather. Um, so we learned a little bit about, we learned a little about the meteor meteorologists. One year, um, we had a freedom themed Seder. Um, it happened to be the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. So we kind of found this other relevant event that was being celebrated in the country. And for each cup of wine, we read a quarter of the Emancipation Pro Proclamation. So kind of by doing that, we shared our freedom with everybody else who got freed in America by the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and there are usually always historical significant events that might have happened that can be celebrated. Um, so it's not just our freedom for Passover, it's the entire, it's, it's many other people's freedoms as well. Um, so kind of, I like to say for, 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 the, for Kiddush, make sure everybody can have a cup, whether they're drinking wine or grape juice, um, do something different with each cup of wine, um, have a different type of wine. Um, so, it's just beyond, kind of take it beyond the Bore Pri Hagafen. Once we move on from all of that, uh, we, we make our wine. The first two big activities that happen at the Seder are the Karpas and the, Afi, and the, and the breaking of the middle matzah that's going to become the Afi Um And one of the things that um, when I was younger, when I went to a Seder or, or heard talk to friends about their Seders, I always thought you had to use a green vegetable for carpas. It's always very traditional that everybody uses a green vegetable. But I, one of my dearest, oldest friends, their family used a potato. Um, and I talked to him about that one year and he said, well, basically um, carpas traditionally is green, but as long as it's not bitter and you can say the same bore pre adama blessing over it, you can use it for carpas. Um, so they use potatoes. Um, we in our house typically will use a celery, um, but there are many, many um, fruits and vegetables upon which Borei Pri Adama can be said. So I don't like to say limit it to a green vegetable. Um, what I found interesting also is that parsley that many people do use, uh, parsley you do not, are, is not really supposed to be a Borei Pri Adama. So some people think it is, but in reality it's, apparently not a Borei Priya Adama on parsley from what my research showed me. Um, but you can kind of see some pictures here. So celery, uh, strawberries, potatoes, carrots, broccoli, cucumbers um, are all eligible to dip as your carpas vegetable. Um, I know some folks who after they make the carpas, they actually have a crudité on the table of all fruits and vegetables from which Borei Priya Adama could be said. And they kind of leave it on the table um, for kind of like an appetizer or a snack for people who might be getting a little hungry. Um, they've already said the blessing over it, so it's still able to be eaten. 
Um, what we then do is we you can also then take this opportunity to learn some more things about your choice of carpas. Um, we typically have a reading about our carpas, but our carpas. Um, so here you'll see um, underneath here. Let me zoom in. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can kind of get a little hint of this. Um, we would have fun facts about celery, and we would go around the table and everybody would read their fun fact about celery. Um, I thought it was kind of cool that celery has negative calories. Um, it takes more calories to eat and digest celery than there is in celery. Um, so we kind of did all of that. Um, after we do that um, is, the, is the Afik Homan. Um, now I remember growing up and I'm sure many of you all do, um, we'd have the Afik Homan, we'd run around the house and one person would find it and then they would get this crisp prize, whether it be a dollar bill, a $5 bill, something like that. And that made me feel really terrible when I didn't find it, but it made me feel amazing when I did find it. So um, at our seders, everybody looks for the Afik Homan and it has been set. And we always have, when we actually use matzah for the Afik Homan, um, enough Afik Homans to be found for everyone to find an Afik Homan. Um, so we might have, if I have six kids, I'm going to hide six different afi, six different pieces of the afi common so everybody gets to find it. Um, and that way everybody can get a prize. Um, and typically, um, I'm not a big, big believer in just giving out dollar bills or things like that. Um, we started one tradition where we would give out the presidential dollars, the gold presidential dollars. So we would start with George Washington. Um, and move through, and, and every year we'd, add, you know, we might give them two or three each year, we kind of move through. Um, you can use the national park, the, the quarters in the national parks, you can kind of use all the different, there's a lot of different collectible currencies, um, you can use collectible, uh, collectible coins, um, you could even use um, foreign currency, you could give people um, Israeli currency that you can go get, so it's not necessarily um, for the, just for the, everybody kind of takes part in it. Um, the other nice thing that we've done, um, I, I like to say that the Afikoman really starts our focus on what's coming for the rest of the night. It really kind of sets ourselves up. We're doing the Halach Ma'anya, we're doing all this other stuff. We're kind of building up to talk about what Passover is and how, um, and the importance of Passover. Um, so you can take this time and we've done what we call a middle matzah mindfulness and getting everybody focused on what, what's gonna happen that night. Um, so we will all participate. This was really cool last year on Zoom where we had everybody take a piece of matzah. We were all reading this together. Um, and then together we broke the, we broke the matzah together. Um, and then we kind of went forward from there. It kind of got us focused on what is coming up um, for the rest of that night. Um, and put us in a kind of nice frame of mind. Um, in the middle over there, you'll see is um, a song. Um, we use, as uh, was mentioned earlier, Alan mentioned earlier, we use a lot of songs in our Seder. Um, some of them are parody songs. Some of them are original songs um, written for Passover. Some of them are just new tune, uh, different tunes to songs that one might know. Um, but we kind of use those to transition between sections maybe introduce a new concept, uh, also use it to wake people up and get them refocused on the events of the evening. Um, we write a lot of songs on our own, um, but you can find a ton of them online. The next big thing is, so after we've, after we've broken our middle matzah, the next big thing we have is the manish tana. Um, and so the way I like to look at this is we're gonna make the night different from all the other nights. And how can we do that? If we go back to our goals of personal, making our seders personal, making our seder real, and making our seder fun, um, so one of the things you could go from a personal perspective um, is ask their guests if they could ask a fifth question, their own question, no question being a bad question, what question would they ask about Passover? And then you can kind of use that question as a jumping off point for further discussions around your seder table. Um, keeping it real, um, these questions are old. The four questions were written many, many years ago. What would the four questions look like if we had to write them today? Um, and then from a fun perspective, um, it's always fun if you ask the four questions in a humorous way. 
One of the best books about that, for those of you who are interested, is a book called 300 Ways to Ask the Four Questions. Um, it does really have 300 different ways to ask the four questions. Um, so what we've, as I said, when we do our themes, uh, when we had our Saturday Night Live theme, we used this book of the four questions and we kind of said, we kind of turned the four questions into an episode of The Californians, for those of you who might be familiar with Saturday Night Live. Um, and we said, how would the people on The Californians ask the four questions? And we kind of came up like this and it was kind of fun. Um, one year we had um, some of our more social media, uh, better at social media people create tweet how you might tweet tweet the four questions being limited in your number of characters. Um, and we had everybody do that. And then we had everybody present the four questions. So you can challenge your guests to maybe if they know a foreign language, how would they say those four questions in that language? Or challenge some of your younger kids to create their own their own language to ask the four questions or just some, some other way to get them involved. Um, you also can use and I don't know if you, can you guys see my little finger puppet that I'm holding up here? There's a little finger puppet for all the four questions you can, you can ask on over here. Um, that's good. Um, so there are finger puppets you can involve your kids with, uh, but lots of different ways. Um, so now after the four questions, we have the story of the four sons. Um, and again, going back to the keeping it personal, keeping it real and keeping it fun, um, I like to, it's not just four sons. What if you're at a Seder where it's mostly daughters? Um, so what would the four sons look like um, if they were daughters? Um, so in the middle here, there's a little reading that I found online about four daughters or the four girls, um, which were then assigned to our Seder guests, uh, our daughters to read. Um, keeping it real, we you can ask, which of the four sons do you relate to? Um, or who, who in the world today do you see as one of the four sons and why? And you can kind of have a discussion. Um, one of the great things about Passover is that there's room for all of this discussion threads from an educational perspective. And you can kind of, you can kind of step that off just by asking, by changing up the four sons that way. Um, as we talked about earlier, when we had our Disney themed Seder, the four sons actually were um, from the land of Winnie the Pooh. Um, and we went around and had everybody read a lot of these. Um, and there was even from a skit perspective, we do skits a lot. Um, you can have the four sons as if they were done by Abbott and Costello in there, who's on first wicked, when, when, who's the wise child, what's the wicked child that I don't know is the simple child. And then you have some of that's what I want to find out. And it just keeps going on. If you're familiar with Abbott and Costello, um, this can really promote a great deal of laughter at your Seder and get a lot of people involved. Um, it's just kind of a fun little way to uh, talk about the four sons. Um, and then after you do this little skit, you can go right into the reading of the four sons. So it's kind of a nice little segue. Um, next, the Haggadah, the way I kind of look at it is the Haggadah kind of goes off on a journey from Abraham to Egypt. It, of course, it ends with, with the whole 10 plagues, the freeing of the Jews. Um, but oftentimes the story of Passover, why we actually are sitting together at, the, at these Seder tables, gets overshadowed by these many readings. In most Haggadahs, you don't see a story of Passover. You just keep going through the readings. Um, and they kind of talk about it. They, they, they hint at it through little readings and passages, but there's no real telling of the story. And we kind of, what I like to kind of say is, after the four sons, maybe time, it's time to put your Haggadahs away and, talk, and tell the story of Passover. So we typically do this through role play skits that we don't necessarily give out in advance because we don't want people um, preparing what they want. It's basically given out there and said, and, and you are assigned a role. In the early years of our Seder, my daughter would write the play um, and she would assign the roles when she wrote the play. Um, and then the kids would get up from the, from the Seder and, excuse me, act out 
the play. Um, and you'll, you'll see here is, I'm going to zoom in again. This is our, this is a play one year and you'll see I highlighted in yellow where M Moses's mom puts the baby Moses in the water and pushes the basket away. And what would happen, actuality would happen there would be a baby doll was actually passed around the table through every guest's hands as if the guests were the river where Moses was floating down in his basket. Um, we would then have Pharaoh, of course, highlighted in red. He would be saying, uh, help me take care of this baby, keep building your pyramids. Uh, we would then have our guests build pyramids out of Legos or have them do some other task of work through the evening. Um, so everybody's kind of involved. Um, the skits evolve over time. Um, it got to the point where we actually stopped writing our own and we just kind of went online. One of my favorite new sites is jubilong.com. And they have a great, it's like 15 roles. So if you have 15 people at your Seder, it's a great, um, it's a great telling of the story that is humorous. Um, it tells you how many lines each person has. Um, so we kind of go around here and we assign everything to all these people. Um, so we actually tell the story Passover so that we don't, so it doesn't get overlooked in the crowd. Um, it doesn't get overshadowed by the whole, um, by all the other little readings that you might find in the Haggadah. Not to say that those are bad readings or we should skip all of them in their entirety, but I think the say, I think it's important to, at a Seder to actually tell people why we are here. And we're here because we were slaves to Pharaoh and he and, and God freed us and all of this and all of that. Um, so that's how we chose to do it. Um, the other, so then the other favorite part of our Seders, I'm going to come over here for a second, is the 10 plagues. And at the 10 plagues, oh, okay, I can't do it. I'm going to go, sorry. Um, we like to, um, we go back to the Haggadah after we tell our story and we talk about the plagues. And um, the plagues are a great opportunity for personalization and changing up your Seder, um, regardless of the ages of the guests. We like to play games with all the 10 plagues when we go through all the 10 plagues. Um, we typically will tie our game to our theme, but here are a couple of samples of our favorite plague games. Um, one of them is a game called Play Goo. And in Play Goo, it's basically the game of taboo uh, people are given a plague on a card and they're also given three words and they have to describe the plague to the guests at the Seder, but they can't use any of those words. So in this example, you might be given the plague of frogs, but you have to describe the plague of frogs without using the word green, jump, or croak. Um, so you can kind of do that with all the plagues. Um, another one that we'll do when we have a theme um, is a game called Guess the Plague. Um, so these are three sample Guess the Plagues. Um, this one was from our movies where we hold up a picture of, let's say a movie poster, what plague is this movie? Um, what plague is this Broadway show? Um, last year, because everybody was home for COVID, everybody was home during the pandemic, a lot of streaming happened, a lot of streaming. So we had our plagues were shows that people were streaming, popular shows that were streamed over Netflix and other uh, streaming media. So we had to had to guess which streamed show was one of the plagues. So these are kind of a game that we kind of put in. Yes, you got to plan it in advance, but or you also could just have a discussion. Um, what movie would you say represents, what would be a movie that you could say is representative of those? You don't necessarily even have to have these. We had them all printed out and stuff like that because that's how I kind of deal with all of that. Um, so that's one plague or plague games. Um, the other thing that's cool are plague masks. So this is boils. Um, so that's kind of cool over there. Um, from a reality perspective, again, um, what would be, what would be your own 10 plagues? 
Um, so we had our, like I said, we had plagues that also tied to our theme. So in our winter wonderland, we had, what are the 10 plagues of winter and how would they relate to the, to the 10 plagues of Egypt? So we have the power outage, which was the winter wonderland or the winter equivalent of the plague of darkness. Um, and then there was a blizzard watch, which was the equivalent to the plague of hail. Um, so that's kind of that over there. The other thing that we kind of also have a lot of fun with, um, and I think it's a great way to encourage other types of participation and other types of um, fun is creating a top as a top as a top ten list. Ten is a big number in Passover. There are ten plagues. Um, so each year throughout the ten plague throughout the night, we would reveal our top ten our own top ten Passover list. Um, it could be the top ten ways, um, the top ten things you, you know that the date your child brings home for Passover isn't going to work out, or the top ten ways uh, Passover is like the NCAA March Madness. Um, we did this one you see here is, uh, if I can maximize room, is the top 10 Passover themed ice cream flavors. And we kind of decided all of them. Um, so you can kind of see what they were. Um, this this year, I will I, I will have to say that th when we did this year, um, my Seder, one of my Seder guests who typically does our top 10 list actually made every one of those ice cream flavors. So we, as part of our dessert, we sampled the top 10 Passover themed ice cream flavors. Um, they were kind of, some of them were not really there, but some of them were really, really good. And we kind of ate them for many, many days afterwards. Um, I'm gonna try, I gotta try, oh, this is what I need to get those ones. Um, the next thing I wanna show you is, that we do also is we bring this, you mentioned earlier with Harry Potter Seder, we brought the plagues to life. We actually envisioned every plague in our Passover Seder, actually acted them all out. And these were some of the tools we used. Um, if you remember uh, the, that clapper from television days? Um, so we had a clapper on the lights that were in our room where we had the Seder. And we would talk about, it was the plague of darkness. So Moses, banged his staff on the ground. And as part of banging his staff on the ground, we would clap our hands and the lights went off because the clapper was there to turn them off. Um, some people may not, that may not work for some folks depending on um, how uh, their level of religiosity. And again, it's all what you are comfortable with. Um, we also would have, uh, we gave the kids bubble wrap for the plague of boils, which is a great way, as a great pastime for the plague of boils. Um, what I'm gonna do right for you right now, hopefully, is I'm gonna demonstrate how we talk about blood. So I think you can see my, this is a cup of water and this is just a red cup. So I always used to tell people, so one day God was there and he turned the water to blood and I would just pour my water into this cup. And I'd say, see, the water's blood. And then there'd always be some smart kid who'd say, oh, it's not really blood because your cup is red. So it just looks like it's blood. And I'd say, oh, and then I'd go like that. And poof, the water actually is blood. So, um, so it's kind of a little interactive demo that we would kind of do for the plagues. Um, it, made, it brought, we would have little interactions for all of the plagues. Um, you can get very creative with the plagues. Um, so that's kind of our little story about the 10 plagues. Um, another great way to uh, add some interactivity in is doing your own virtual parting of the Red Sea. And um, the instructions are over there. There is also a video um, you can go to online. If you just look at, there's, a, there's actually a scientific theory behind all of this works. I don't pretend to understand it. But basically, if you take a bowl of water, throw some black pepper flakes into it, that's the Red Sea. And you can tell a whole big fancy story about it. Um, and then you can put some dish soap on your fingertip. And then that dish soap can be Moses's staff. And when you put your fingertip that has the Ajax soap 
in it into that water, the pepper actually makes a path. So you've actually visually parted the Red Sea. Um, it's kind of cool. The kids love it. Um, my suggestion is if you're going, if you do that, you practice beforehand so you get the quantities down right and you know exactly how to work it out. But it's a really great um, visual effort um, to do. After we talk about all these stories, it's, it is the time to talk about, of course, our Seder plate. Um, and we'd like to make it a, in our house, we'd like to make it a plate to remember. Um, so we do have our traditional six items on the Seder plate, but then there are times where we'll add other items. So what you'll see, um, there are people who add olives to the Seder plate. So if you ask your, each of your guests to bring an item that isn't traditionally on a Seder plate that they might wanna put on a Seder plate and then come up with a reason why. So there are folks who put olives on a Seder plate um, for peace. Bananas was popular one year um, related to a story about, Syrian, about, uh, about Syria and how kids were being fed bananas to survive and the world wasn't really paying attention to the plight of the Syrian refugees. So there was a whole big movement to add a banana to a Seder plate. Um, there are many reasons about the orange on a Seder plate. Um, one year we had onion on our Seder plate for tears because things like that. Um, so we always like to keep it fun with our Seder plate. We do go over our Seder plate as well. Um, one of our favorites is Haroset. Um, and I know the last year, I think there was a whole big uh, webinar I saw about spicing up your Seder using Sephardic Haroset. I'm actually very intrigued. We're going to, go, going to try to take a look at that. Um, Haroset is very big at our Seder. We don't limit ourselves. And I, and I like to say people, don't limit yourself to the traditional Haroset because you can have so much fun with Haroset. Um, we actually can tie out your Haroset to themes. So what you'll see over here are, we have three Harosets. You have one Haroset over here. That's the traditional Haroset. And this was our Haroset for our Saturday Night Live comedy Seder. So what we had over here was the Blues Brothers. So it was blueberry, it was a blueberry based Haroset. And then over here, it was our Roseanne Banana Dana Haroset based on Gilda Radner's character because Gilda Radner was one of the most famous Jewish, uh, Jewish comedians of all time on Saturday Night Live. So this was a banana, a banana based Haroset. Um, during our Las Vegas Seder, of course, we had the Luxor Pyramid made out of haroset with some ground nuts over here. Um, um, the other thing that's kind of interesting from a learning perspective, um, there's this whole, we all read Shir HaShirim um, in, in Shul on the Shabbat during Passover, um, and there's a whole allegory, a whole reasons why it. Um, many uh, scholars believe that the actual recipe for haroset comes, is very, is embedded in Shir HaShirim. So we kind of do that one year and that we actually will build this. You can see here, it's apples and raisins, wine, apricots, spices, figs, and walnuts. Um, so there's a traditional um, recipe for haroset um, that you can kind of, and I like to say, explore the world. You can experience the world, um, the whole world through flavors. It's one of the strongest senses that we have um, and it can really spark a lot of discussions and things like that. And it's a really great way to um, bring folks into the Seder by, in, by uh, playing on their sense of taste. You can even have, um, I, I envision one year, um, a Food Network themed Seder where haroset making is an episode of Chopped. And every family comes and I, we give them a basket of ingredients and they have to make a haroset out of it. Um, so we kind of do that there. Um, and so I'm kind of, I just want to leave you guys and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, I know there's a lot here and don't kind of get bogged down in it because the Seder has been around for a long time. The Haggadah has been around for a long time. It can handle pretty much anything you throw at it. If you want to get some, I hope you found something you might want to explore deeper um, and play with a little bit. Um, but I just want to let you know, I just want to leave with you the fact that you can, there are things you can do. 
Um, whatever you feel comfortable doing, um, don't worry if it doesn't work. Don't feel like, oh, it's a mess and I'll never try it again. I can tell you I have many, many things that we've done that we'll never ever do again, but that didn't stop us from trying other things. Um, but it is, it is possible to take your Seder and transform it. It is possible for you to spice up your Seder, so to speak, um, and just bring it a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more interactive, a little bit more family friendly. Um, and so I'll just say from my Seder to your Seder, I thank you for your time and I'm more than happy to take any questions or anything else you want to share with. And I can, I think I'll let Alan manage that part of it since I can't deal with any of that. We, are there questions? Anybody have questions? Okay, I'm allowing everyone to unmute themselves if they want to, to ask any questions. Let's see, on chat, we have uh, Bruce Fagan asking, uh, Barry, can you send the PowerPoint to you or any of the participants that want it? Uh, I can. Um... Well, I, I have I have it, and I have a list of people, so I'll take care of it as long as it's okay with you. It's, per it's perfectly okay with me. Um, yeah. just, you know, the, um, some of the links in there are live links. There's a couple of links that might be actual lives. If you click on them, you'll actually get to the link. Okay. Uh, Jerry said, we created two games for our satyrs, Passover Jeopardy and Passover Bingo. Both have questions, answers, and clues that draw on both the Passover story and rituals as well as relevant events in our family and modern day events and ideas. Yeah, I think that's great. We actually, one of the things that I do, we do is we actually play a game, a family game every year, um, a Passover themed game. One of my favorites was The Price is Right, where we actually had, um, you had to guess just like you had, we had contestants and you had to guess the price of a various Passover item. Um, and the prices were right from our local supermarket. Um, and then we would actually have the Passover showcase where it was, guess the price of the turkey meal with the turkey and the, the turkey and the, and the, and the matzah star for stuffing and kind of come up with a price like that. Um, so games are really a great way also to do that. We've done lots of, we've done family feud. Um, we've done the match game. So all the older school TV games, we can actually turn, in, you actually can. You can kind of see in that little picture um, on the lower right, that is our Las Vegas game where we actually had um, video game. We actually had a human slot machine where um, people would pull the human slot machine. So games are really great. And I think those are all fun. There's some great Jeopardy games for Passover already made online as well. Uh, David Singer asked uh, two questions. First one is about uh, play goo. Can you say more? Where do you get the cards? Uh, three by five index cards bought at Staples or a play goo template that I, you can download online. Okay. Where did you download it from? Do you remember? Uh, that actually I hand drew. That one that you saw, I actually hand drew in like right. Microsoft Word or something like that. I just kind of created it. And the next question is how do you engage older kids? Um, with the older kids, we kind of do more. So that was kind of where that Twitter came about is we had our older kids create Twitter versions of the four questions because of course, all the older parents don't really know what Twitter is or how to tweet. Um, and we kind of let them do things. One year for a, from an Afi Komen standpoint, we let the kids hide it. And the kids were in completely in charge of Afi Komen. And they got to hide it they got to figure out how, how they were going to, so we gave them some time to leave and figured out how they were going to hide it and then how they were going to tell us how to find it. So we kind of created special activities for them. Okay. Is there any, besides the one website you gave us, the jubalong.com, are there other websites you recommend? Um, so one of my favorite websites um, is... If you go to the website for the four questions book I talked about, which is whyisthisnight.com, there is a link to multiple, uh, there's another link, I think it's Satyrs Are Fun, I believe is the name of that website. Um, it's run by the same gentleman who runs the what, Why Is This Night, and he's got a ton of stuff on it. Um, my favorite, my favorite website of all is Bang It Out, 
Bookshop.com, which is a it's a it's an odd site based out of New York, um, but it has a ton of every Jewish holiday themed material in it. So I, I use a lot. And every year they create a bang it out supplement, which has hundreds and hundreds of pages of that. Um, but typically um, Google, if you just Google Passover fun, you know, fun things for Passover Seder, you're gonna get a ton of hits of websites, which is kind of what I do. I just kind of decide that I'm gonna have, let's say I'm gonna have my Las Vegas theme and I wanna talk about famous Jews of Las Vegas. I go to Google and I say, Famous Jews from Las Vegas. And it gives me the entire, and then from there I can kind of build it. Um, I do maintain, I do print out a lot of stuff and I just keep it. Um, I have a huge box of stuff. The box actually broke today. I'm not very happy about that, <laughs> um, but we're getting there. The question was, can you give information about creating the Disney Haggadah? Um, so that, there is a there is a Disney Haggadah out there in real life. Um, ours are just a, it's just a supplement, um, and so I just kind of went online and searched for Disney Passover, um, and it just kind of meandered through Google. Um, I did download a Disney font to create that Disney thing. Um, the song that we had that brief was actually written by my daughter and my wife about. 45 minutes before the Seder. It was, it, was, it, was, it was like, it was really crazy, um, but it was really a great hit. Um, the wine bottles, the wine bottle openers, um, but the readings, we just kind of, there's, there also is um, in that Disney Haggadah, there was a song, um, it's to the tune of supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Um, then there was also with a, a spoonful of choroset helps the horseradish go down. Every one of those songs was found online. Um, I can, if you want, I can send you a copy of our Disney um, supplement and that can be distributed out. I can forward it over to Alan and he can send it out if you'd like. I have, I have word versions of all of our Passover stuff. So I can send it off to Alan if that would help. That'd be great, please. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, well, Barry, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank all for participating. I found it very thank interesting. You. I think that was great. Thank you. Great thank job. you very much. I'm glad you all enjoyed. I hope you get something out of it. Um, a lot of fun. So yeah, um, there's a lot of other interactivities that we could do. Um, just, oh, I'll just show you this here. This was for um, the Plague of Cows. We had a bunch of these. You all know what this thing is. <laughs> um, the kids loved it during the appropriate time at the Seder. Um, I only have one left because the other ones kind of disappeared. Um, I didn't want to have them off. But um, even those little kid toys, see and say, they're actually a great toy for Passover. <laughs> um, it's amazing what's out there in the world. Uh, there used to be where you couldn't go into a store. Uh, you had to go to like your kosher butcher's um, and things like that. You have to go to kosher butchers to get anything related to Passover or Judaica shops. But now they actually have them in the supermarket. They have things you can use. Um, really amazing to me that they have all of that stuff. Um, it's sad to me that it's all in the supermarket right now because that means Passover is right around the corner. Um, so I kind of dread walking in the supermarket and seeing all the Passover stuff. It's, um, but it's there. And, um, but you can all, you can go pretty much anywhere. Amazon has tons of Passover stuff. Parties, the party stores now even have Passover stuff, which never growing up, you never have to go to the, you go to the party store and there would never be birthday party stuff with Passover food and stuff in the party stores. So I would just tell people to have fun, um, start small. I mean, we started really small. We did a few little songs and things like that. And then it's kind of every year it just grows and grows and grows. Um, we started with just, you know, a one hour fixed time limit. Um, we're now up to an hour and a half. So it's older. Everybody gets older. Everybody has a little bit more patience. Um, last year though, we were limited to 40 minutes because of Zoom. Right. Free Zoom. And last year, of course, Zoom worked. Um, it worked. It's different. It's harder on Zoom. And I know I think Alan or some, one of the other Alans is doing a thing on how to do it on Zoom. I would urge everybody to 
take that. Um, we actually had a trial run Seder one night. We did a fake Seder. We did a Seder one night on Zoom, and then we had our real Seder the next night. Um, so we could iron out the technology kinks. Mm -hmm. There's some kings that did that last year. Well, thank you again. Uh, if you'd thank like you. to, a donation to FJMC to honor Barry. It's again, and it's at the top of your chat, fjmc.org slash donate. Again, I want to thank Barry and thank everybody for participating. Have a wonderful day. And I'm very happy Passover. Thanks, Barry. I need you to inspire thank me. You. Thank you very much. It's great. Have a great day. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Thank you.